Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, well, good afternoon, and uh, thanks for all braving the Monday version of Snowmageddon to be here today. We had a whole inch of snow out there and on campus, so, you know, it was rough going out there. Uh, my name is Kevin Schofield. I'm here to introduce and welcome William Gibson, who's joining us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series today. Uh, Mr. Gibson's here today to discuss his book, Distrust That Particular Flavor. Though he's known primarily as a novelist, he's been sought out by many publications for his insights into contemporary culture. Wired Magazine sent him to Singapore to report on one of the world's most buttoned up states. The New York Times Magazine asked him to describe what was wrong with the internet. Rolling Stone published his essay on the ways our lives are all soundtracked by the music and the culture around us. And in a speech at the 2010 Book Expo, he memorably described the interactive relationship between writer and reader. William Gibson is the author of several books, including Spook Country, Pattern Recognition, and of course, his 1984 debut novel, Neuromancer, which was the first novel to win the three top science fiction prizes, the Hugo Award, the Nebula, and the Philip K. Dick Memorial Award. He was a pioneer of the cyberpunk genre, and he's credited with coining the term cyberspace in his short story, Burning Chrome. Please join me in welcoming William Gibson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. And I've never, one of the interesting things about touring this book is that I've never read some of these pieces to an audience before. And the first of the three pieces I'm going to read to you right now, I've, I've never read before. And until I read something to an audience, I don't actually, I can't actually read it because the, the process, the process of, of composition for me is such that I can never, I can never be the reader. But when I do it, when I read it aloud to a live audience, some kind of feedback loop is completed. And for just that one time, I get to I get to hear it. The next time I read it, it becomes performance, but it, it's all it's always something of a big deal for me to to read one of these for the first time. So this is called Time Machine Cuba, and this was written in two thousand and six, and. I came to write it, I was asked to write an introduction to a new standard paperback edition, like a black spine penguin of H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. And it was a very flattering, <clears throat> very flattering to be asked to do that. And I love The Time Machine and have been since I, I first read it. And I tried to do it, but I couldn't do it. And for some reason, it kept being too much about me. And eventually, I told them, I just can't do this. I'm not uh, a literary academic. I'm not a literary historian. And you, I don't want the, you know, Mr. Wells' book out there with some kind of overly personal, too much information about me in it. You know? So I bowed out of it. And, left the thing in a corner and a couple of years later I was looking at it and I thought, well, I'll just extract the piece. I'll, try, I'll try to find whatever it was that I was trying to say about me while I was talking about Wells. And I did that and uh, my friend Eileen Gunn here in Seattle published it on Infinite Matrix, her, her science fiction webzine. And it's called Time Machine Cuba in, in this iteration. And this is, this is what, it, what it says. <laughs> I learned of science fiction and history in a single season. History I found in the basement of an old brick house I happened to pass each day 
on my way to elementary school in a small town in Virginia. This house stood vacant, but was in too conspicuous a state of repair to seem haunted and had never interested me. One afternoon, though, I noted that workmen had arrived and that some sort of renovation was being prepared for. Squeezing in past a sheet of plywood, I explored a series of cold, empty rooms. One of these, my heart beat faster, contained a damp old trunk. Having worked up the nerve to open it, I found only a few faded lithographs, as I now imagine they were, of airplanes. But these were airplanes unlike any I had seen, and they held my attention in a peculiar way. They were old, clearly of some other era, but exciting and somehow frightening as well. Squatting there, staring at them, I felt as though some enormous wedge of information was being driven into my head. Various bits and pieces of half-knowledge were coming together, forming some new and utterly unexpected whole. I already knew, as if by osmosis, that there had been a war, though I didn't know when or with whom. I had been raised so far by adults who sometimes spoke of the war as some previous time or era or world, but I had somehow never associated that with other, more vague ideas of some past and general conflict. I had read comic books about war and played with military toys, but had never considered how those might fit into some way the world had actually been. I had found World War II in that trunk. I had discovered history, or it, me, and I would never be the same. Science fiction, then, I found on various wire racks, one of them offering a 15-cent copy of the Classics Illustrated version of the Time Machine, which must have led me, just as its publishers claimed to have intended it to, to Wells' text. When George Powell's film version was released in 1960, I already felt, though secretly, that the time machine was mine, part of a personal and growing collection of alternate universes, and that no one else in the theater really got it. Even more secretly, I had filled a blue horse lined notebook with elaborate pencil sketches for my own actual working time machine. It looked, I recall, rather more like the machine in the Classics Illustrated version than the one in George Powell's film. The Classics, time, the classics Illustrated time machine resembled a model of the atom, but I had imagined this for my own purposes as geared in some achingly complex spheres within spheres way that I could never quite envision in operation but which would somehow allow it to move in three dimensions at once. That, I imagined, just might do the trick. I suspected, without admitting it to myself, that time travel might be a magic on the order of being able to kiss one's own elbow, which had seemed initially to be quite theoretically possible. But I was determined not to admit it. The possibility was too delicious to relinquish. Although I now think I had no specific time travel adventures in mind, no head-scratching paradoxes to be explored. I don't remember dreaming of exploring the past of the world around me or of journeying to its future. What I wanted was to attain the world of the time machine, the Morlock's Garden. Wells' Victorian future nightmare had become a favorite fantasy land for me because it existed so far up the timeline as to be beyond history. And history, once acknowledged, had quickly become a sort of nightmare, one from which there seemed to be no escape. History I was learning there at the start of the 1960s never stops happening.
I had become an involuntary sponge for modern history after my discoveries of World War II and science fiction. Much of the science fiction I was reading, American fiction of the 1940s and 50s, had already become history of a sort, requiring an acquired filter for anachronism. I studied the patent future history timeline Robert Heinlein appended to each of his novels and noted where it began to digress from history as I was coming to know it. I filtered indigestible bits of anachronistic gristle out of his older science fiction, reverse engineering a model of the real past through a growing understanding of what these authors had gotten wrong. In another trunk, in my own family attic, I had unearthed World War I, a much more substantial trove, this one. Rolled memorial scrolls bearing the names of the hometown dead and the lightly rusted and altogether astonishing mass of a Colt Model 1911 automatic pistol. I watched the CBS documentary series 20th Century on Sunday nights, moved by the eminently sane Midwestern voice of Walter Cronkite as he narrated aspects of the unimaginably complex and peculiar historical reality in which I was learning that I lived. I learned about D-Day, the concentration camps, the atomic bomb, and the Cold War. With these last two, Cronkite's restrained narration met my growing and secret terror at where history and science, or history as science fiction, seemed almost certainly to be taking us. <clears throat> and now, walking to school past the house where I had discovered World War II, I passed the post office, newly marked with metal signs bearing the black and yellow civil defense symbol used to indicate fallout shelters. Sirens were tested regularly, along with something called the system. And the dial of my first transistor radio was marked twice with that same symbol, indicating the two frequencies set aside for civil defense. Freed by Wells and his literary descendants to roam in my imagination up and down the timeline, I had stumbled upon World War III and the end of civilization. Wells had discovered the end of civilization long before me. It must have seemed that it kept coming back throughout his life to oppress him. The vision of cataclysm and systemic collapse fueled by some basic immaturity of the species to bring an end, at least temporarily, to modern history and technological progress. He must have expected it constantly through World Wars I and II. He would have been terribly aware of it looming again in the years immediately before his death with the military use of atomic energy and established fact. In 1905, he had imagined it arriving with the military use of aerial bombs against civilian targets. But then he would see Zeppelins bomb London, and after that, the Blitz, and then the advent of the German rocket bomb. In the time machine, wars are a thing of the immemorial past, something necessarily transcended on the way to some safer, more rational basis for society none of which mattered to me as I cringed my way through the heating up of the Cold War, expecting any moment the wailing of the sirens that would call us all into the basement of the post office. The television dramatization of Pat Frank's Alas Babylon, a popular novel set in a small Florida town in the immediate aftermath of nuclear war, had sealed my fate. Something akin to Sartre's dictum that hell is other people was dawning on me. And part of the cloud of constant secret terror I inhabited was some conviction that my neighbors, confined in what I imagined as the stifling darkness of a civil defense fallout shelter, 
would prove to be my own personal Morlock. The appeal of the time machine for me then became one purely of escape. I longed for Wells' ellipsis, the long blur forward, night following day like the flapping of a black wing. I longed to find myself on the far side of whatever terrible, inevitable history was about to happen. I saw with utmost clarity the World War II howitzers on the town's courthouse lawn dusted with the falling detritus of Chicago and the sky above glowing with a new and deadly clarity. I didn't understand that Wells himself had written a more thorough end to humanity in the time machine than any I imagined descending on America as I knew it. The perversely enjoyable melancholy that pervades the garden of the Eloy emanates not from the hidden underworld of the Morlock, nor from their grisly symbiosis with their former masters, but from the exquisite and utterly deliberate job of world wrecking Wells has performed for us. Writers before and after Wells have enjoyed the heady pleasures of reducing the great monuments of their day to imaginary ruin, but few have attained the degree of symbolic elegance, nor the convincingly forlorn realism of the palace of green porcelain. The palace proves to be the ruin of a museum. A single humble box of safety matches preserved in an airtight case is the treasure the time traveler takes with him from that museum of man, a last working token of technology, light and destruction both in a palm-sized packet. Matches, camphor, and a heavy lever broken from a nameless piece of machinery to serve as club and pry bar. He leaves the museum with the tools of his early ancestors, fire and the club. I had my own ancient tool of destruction and taught myself, crouching in secret places, to disassemble it, my impossible, scary, secret provision from history. I lightly oiled the parts and hid them separately, wrapped in rags. This being Virginia in the early 60s, I easily obtained a box of ammunition, alarmingly heavy finger-thick shells with bullets the color of a new copper penny. I possessed the pistol, it seemed to me, much as a time traveler possessed his matches and his makeshift club, though far less purposefully. He leaves the palace of green porcelain with a plan. And I had no plan, only a global and unexpressed terror of impending nuclear war and of the end of history and the need to somehow feel in control of something. Three years into my discovery of history, it was announced that Soviet ballistic missiles had been deployed in Cuba. My encounter with history, I absolutely knew, was about to end then, and perhaps my species with it. In his preface to the 1921 edition of War in the Air, Wells wrote of World War I, still able to call it then, the Great War. The great catastrophe marched upon us in daylight but everybody thought that somebody else would stop it before it really arrived. Behind that great catastrophe march others today. In his preface to the 1941 edition, he could only add, again, I asked the reader to note the warnings I gave in that year 20 years ago. Is there anything to add to that preface now? Nothing except my epitaph. That, when the time comes, will manifestly have to be I told you so, you damned fools. The italics, he wrote, are mine. <laughs> the italics are indeed his. The terminally exasperated visionary, the technologically fluent Victorian who had watched the 20th century arrive with all its astonishing baggage of change and who had come to trust in the minds of the sort of men who ran British Rail. 
They are the italics of the perpetually impatient and somehow perpetually unworldly futurist, seeing his model going terminally wrong in the hands of the less clever, the less evolved. And they are with us today, those italics, though I've long since learned to run shy of science fiction that employs them. I suspect that I began to distrust that particular flavor of italics when the world didn't end in October of 1962. I can't recall the resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis at all. My anxiety and the world's reached some absolute peak and then declined, history moving on, so much of it. And sometimes today, the world of my own childhood strikes me as scarcely less remote than the world of Wells' childhood. So much has changed in the meantime. I may actually have begun to distrust science fiction then, or rather to distrust it differently, as my initial passion for it began to decline around that time. I found Henry Miller then, and William Burroughs, Jack Kerouac, and others, voices of another kind, and the science fiction I continued to read was that which somehow was resonant with those other voices and where those voices seemed to be leading me. And it may also have begun to dawn on me around that same time that history, though initially discovered in whatever soggy trunk or in, in whatever caliber, is a species of speculative fiction itself prone to changing interpretation and further discovery. <clears throat> and this was, this was an op-ed for the New York Times on the, the occasion of the centenary of George Orwell's birthday. Walking along Henrietta Street recently by London's Covent Garden, looking for a restaurant, I found myself thinking of George Orwell. Victor Golantz Limited, publisher of Orwell's early work, had its offices there in 1984 when they published my first novel, a novel of an imagined future. At the time, I felt I had lived most of my life under the looming shadow of that mythic year Orwell having found his title by inverting the final digits of the year of his book's completion. It seemed very strange to actually be alive in 1984. In retrospect, I think it, it has seemed stranger even than living in the 21st century. I had a valuable secret in 1984, though, one I owed in large part to Orwell, who would have turned 100 today. I know that the novel I, I knew that the novel I had written wasn't really about the future, just as 1984 hadn't been about the future, but about 1948. I had relatively little anxiety about eventually finding myself in a society of the sort Orwell imagined. I had other fish to fry in terms of history and anxiety, and indeed I still do. Today on Henrietta Street, one sees the rectangular housings of closed circuit television cameras angled watchfully down from shop fronts. Orwell might have seen these as something out of Jeremy Bentham, the utilitarian philosopher, penal theorist, and spiritual father of the panoptic project of surveillance. But for me, they posed stranger possibilities. The street itself seeming to evolve sensory apparatus in the service of some meta project beyond any imagining of the closed circuit systems designers. Orwell knew the power of the press, our first mass medium. And at the BBC, he'd witnessed the first electronic medium, radio, as it was brought to bear on wartime public opinion. He died before broadcast television had come into its own. But had he lived, I doubt that anything about it would have much surprised him. The media of 1984 are broadcast technology imagined in the service of a totalitarian state, and no different from the media of Saddam Hussein's Iraq or of North Korea today. 
technologically backward societies in which information is still mostly broadcast. Indeed, today, reliance on broadcasting is the very definition of a technologically backward society. Elsewhere, driven by the acceleration of computing power and connectivity and the simultaneous development of surveillance systems and tracking technologies, we are approaching a theoretical state of absolute informational transparency, one in which Orwellian scrutiny is no longer a strictly hierarchical top-down activity, but to some extent a democratized one. As individuals steadily lose degrees of privacy, so too do corporations and states. Loss of traditional privacies may seem in the short term to be driven by issues of national security but this may prove in time to have been intrinsic to the nature of ubiquitous information. Certain goals of the government's total, now terrorist, information awareness initiative may eventually be realized simply by the evolution of the global information system, but not necessarily or exclusively for the benefit of the United States or any other government. This outcome <coughs> may be an inevitable result of the migration to cyberspace of everything that we do with information. Had Orwell known that computers were coming out of Bletchley Park, oddly, a dilapidated English country house, home to the pioneering efforts of Alan Turing and other wartime code breakers, he might have imagined a ministry of truth empowered by punch cards and vacuum tubes to better wring the last vestiges of freedom from the population of Oceania. But I doubt his story would have been very different. Would East Germany's Stasi have been saved if its agents had been able to mouse away on PCs into the 90s? The system would still have been crushed. It just wouldn't have been under the weight of paper surveillance. Orwell's pro projections come from the era of information broadcasting and are not applicable to our own. Had Orwell been able to equip Big Brother with all the tools of artificial intelligence, he would still have been writing from an older paradigm and the result would never have described our situation today, nor suggested where we might be heading. That our own biggish brothers in the name of national security draw from ever wider and increasingly transparent fields of data may disturb us, but this is something that corporations, non-governmental organizations, and individuals do as well, with greater and greater frequency. The collection and management of information at every level is exponentially empowered by the global nature of the system itself, a system unfettered by national boundaries or, increasingly, government control. It is becoming unprecedentedly difficult for anyone, anyone at all, to keep a secret. In the age of the leak and the blog of evidence extraction and link discovery, truths will either out or be outed later, if not sooner. This is something I would bring to the attention of every diplomat, politician, and corporate leader. The future eventually will find you out. The future, wielding unimaginable tools of transparency, will have its way with you. In the end, you will be seen to have done that which you did. I say truths, however, and not truths, as the other side of information's new ubiquity can look not so much transparent as outright crazy. Regardless of the number and power of the tools used to extract patterns from information, any sense of meaning depends on context, with interpretation coming along in support of one agenda or another. A world of informational transparency will necessarily be one of deliriously multiple viewpoints, shot through with misinformation, disinformation, conspiracy theories, and a quotidian degree of madness. We may be able to see what's going on more quickly, but that doesn't mean we'll agree about it any more readily. Orwell did the job he set out to do, did it forcefully and brilliantly in the painstaking creation of our best-known dystopia. 
I've seen it said that because he chose to go there as rigorously and fearlessly as he did, we don't have to. I like to think there's some truth to that. But the ground of history has a way of shifting the most basic assumptions from beneath the most scrupulously imagined situation. Dystopias are no more real than utopias. None of us ever really inhabits either, except in the case of dystopias, in the relative and ordinarily tragic sense of life in some extremely unfortunate place. This is not to say that Orwell failed in any way, but rather that he succeeded. 1984 remains one of the quickest and most succinct routes to the core realities of 1948. If you wish to know an era, study its most lucid nightmares. In the mirrors of our darkest fears, much will be revealed. But don't mistake those mirrors for roadmaps to the future or even to the present. We've missed the train to Oceania and live today with stranger problems. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm, I'll read one more very short one. Those two pieces are, you know, examples of what happens when editors ask me to write something about something. Uh, something in particular. And this is an example of what happens when, when an editor asks me to write anything, just of a, you know, just about a page of it, please. <laughs> and some sub magazine of, of Forbes was brave enough, brave enough to do that in 1998. And I've actually, I think that I, I don't know if I'm still mining this particular piece, but I, I know I've mined it for a good 20 years afterwards. And this is called, this is called Dead Man Sing. Time moves in one direction, memory in another. We are that strange species that constructs artifacts intended to counter the natural flow of forgetting. I sometimes think that nothing really is new, that the first pixels were particles of ochre clay, the bison rendered in just the resolution required. The bison still functioned perfectly all these millennia later, and what screen in the world today shall we say of that in a decade? And yet the bison will be there for us on whatever screens we have, carried out of the primal dark on some impulse we each have felt as children, drawing, but carried nonetheless on this thing we have always been creating, this vast, unlikely mechanism that carries memory in its interstices, this global, communal, prosthetic memory that we have been building ever since we learned to build. We live in, have lived through a strange time. I know this because when I was a child, the flow of forgetting was relatively unimpeded. I know this because the dead were less of a constant presence then, because the, there was once no rewind button, because the soldiers dying in the psalm were black and white and did not run as the living run, because the world's attic was still untidy, because there were old men in the mountain valleys of my Virginia childhood who remembered a time before recorded music. When we turn on the radio in a New York hotel room and hear Elvis singing Heartbreak Hotel, we are seldom struck by the peculiarity of our situation that a dead man sings. In the context of the longer life of the species, it is something that only just changed a moment ago. It is something new, and I sometimes feel that, yes, everything has changed. This perpetual toggling between nothing being new under the sun and everything having very recently changed, absolutely, 
is perhaps the central driving tension of my work. Our now has become at once more unforgivingly brief and unprecedentedly elastic. The half-life of media product grows shorter still till it threatens to vanish altogether, everything into some weird quantum logic of its own. The Warholian 15 minutes becoming a quark-like blink. Yet once admitted to the culture's consensus pantheon, certain things seem destined to be with us for a very long time indeed. This is a function in large part of the rewind button. And we would, all of us, to some extent, wish to be in heavy rotation. And as this capacity for recall and recommodification grows more universal, history itself is seen to be even more obviously a construct subject to revision. If it had been our business as a species to damn the flow of time through the creation and maintenance of mechanisms of external memory, what will we become when all these mechanisms, as they now seem intended ultimately to do, merge? The end point of human culture may well be a single moment of effectively endless duration, an infinite digital now. But then again, perhaps there is nothing new in the end of all our beginnings, and the bison will be there waiting for us. Thank you. I would never write something like that if if I knew I were going to have to read it one day. <laughs> so actually, it was good. It was good for me that I, I didn't think I didn't think I would have to. Anyway, if anyone has any questions, I, I will attempt to to answer them, and then I will, I will sign some books. And thank you for coming. So uh, if Orwell's 1984 is a lucid nightmare guidebook to the year 1948, what does Neuromancer tell us now about the year 1984? It was very consciously, well, I can tell you that when I began to write Neuromancer and all the way through it, I, I was very conscious of, as it seemed to me, the fact that it would ultimately become, it would ultimately be read as an artifact of the year of the year 19, 19 of the year 1984. It's, it's, you know, the the world of neuromancer, so the North America of neuromancer. And I say North America because you cannot prove by textual evidence that the United States exists as a. a geopolitical entity in the world of Neuromancer. It just seems to be city-states and, and large corporations. Um, is, is basically, it's Reaganomics turned up to 11. There's no middle class. And, uh, you know, nowadays I'm starting to think that that may be the part of the book that was actually prescient. <laughs> because the you know the the cyberspace is <laughs> the cyberspace of neuromancer is not is obviously not our our cyberspace but you know maybe that's politically i suppose that was that was it you know that was it for me that there're no there're no straight people in neuromancer there, there, are no, there, there are no good middle class. There don't seem to be any suburbs. And, and I think I hadn't quite, it hadn't quite dawned on me at that point. It took a few years that as I was like wandering in the children's cru crusade through, through the 60s, the politicals kept telling me, at least the, the only ones I would listen to at all, who, who were on, on the left kept telling me that it was, you know, everything wrong was the fault of the middle class. 
And it, you know, it seems, it, looking, looking back, it seems like everything good about that era, including the children's crusade I was a part of, emerged because there was a middle class. And countries, you know, societies that don't have a middle class are not much fun. I mean, all the, all the fun countries have a, have a big middle class at least to my taste. Anyway. Yes, way in the back. Hey. Uh, so thanks for your talk. It's been great. Um, one thing I'd like to mention, or I guess the question is, um, back in the, the late 70s, early 80s, like punk, you know, one of the big hallmarks of punk was punk is dead, you know, like after, you know, the death of Sid Vicious or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, like more recently, cyberpunk, it, even in, in the early 2000s, like there was this concept of, you know, the future is here already, the cyberpunk is, is passe, everything turned into techno thrillers. Um, but every once in a while, I still see like an interesting article or, or some little novella or something that, that really like captures the spirit. I, I want to know what you think the evolution of the genre is, or, or do you think it really is past, or, or does it still have legs? Well, I can tell you what I think. I think what, cy what cyberpunk is today is it, it's, a, it's a particular, mainly it's a, the word's function is, is as a particular kind of stylistic signifier. It's like a Pantone chip in popular culture. And somebody says, did you see that video? It's kind of, kind of cyberpunk. You sort of know what that person means. Somebody says, wow, her pants are way cyberpunk. And I look, yeah. It, it, works. it works that way. It doesn't, I don't think there's any other way today that it works as well, that, we're, that it works as well as that. The, I don't want to get into the tedious and rather small time history of, of how the word cyberpunk came to be associated with my own work, but it sure wasn't my creation, nor was it the creation of any of my colleagues at the time who, who were, we were all kind of working, it, working in a similar way. It's a journalistic label. It's like hippies never called themselves hippies. As soon as a, a hippie was actually a put down. So as soon as, anybody came, as soon as some journalist came in and said, look at those hippies, it was kind of over. And the first time I heard cyberpunk, my fellow, you know, fellow travelers, who were mostly a decade or more younger, we're like really excited. What did he call us? And I said, No, no, no! Don't let them put that on you. <laughs> that'll mean that'll mean it's a, that'll mean it's over. And it did. And, and the the way it meant it, but the way it meant it was over is kind of kind of interesting. And it, 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 that is that it allowed the commercial genre of science fiction to encapsulate. What, to encapsulate what was, in fact, a, a rather seriously dissident influence. And once encapsulated, it becomes a sort of cicatrice. So there's like a, an interesting bump on the trunk of the tree of science fiction. But it's just part of the tree of science fiction. And they could pay us and pat us on the head and give us Hugo Awards. But the rest of science fiction could stay just as naff and boring as, as it had <laughs> it had become. And you know, that that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yes, on the on the end. You, you yes. I forget people need the the tech. Um, in the book you mention uh, steam engine time as this kind of paradigm time where people can then put stuff together on the field and then be able to extrapolate farther out. Do you see that, especially in the past decade, 
uh, growing, kind of almost mirroring mir uh, Moore's law, that, that the time between these steam engine times are actually getting shorter and shorter as this leads toward technology acceleration, that, that there are paradigms within even like five or 10 years that people are, you know, the future is here, it's yeah. just unequally distributed. That's it's true. getting obsolete before it actually gets distributed and a new yeah. future replaces it's it. A, that's a really interesting, interesting observation. And yeah, I, 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 would, I would agree. It's, that's part of why I don't, I don't think we have, not only do we not possess a future culturally in the sense that, that we did when I was a kid, but neither, neither do, we, do we possess a now in, in, in the same way. I mean, in 1912, I'm pretty sure the phrase the 21st century was resonant, widely resonant in ways that in 2012, the phrase the 22nd century is not. Doesn't do anything. Try it, you know? Try it when you're alone. Go, the 20s. <laughs> There's nothing. There's no, no vibe. It's just kind of like more, more stuff. <laughs> it's like we don't have the culture. We don't have this like cultural excitement that people, people once, once had about that. Part of the reason is that <clears throat> our now is so astonishingly brief. It's so moment to moment subject to revision. I mean, somebody, somebody could get a text message in this room right now, you know, everybody, and everybody, go, everything's changed. And it wouldn't be that weird for us, you know? Well, it would be weird that it changed, but we're kind of used to that. Like, that's all happened to us a number, a number of times. And so the the now is, is like too small, too small to, to provide a base to erect. It's too small and too volatile to erect this sort of big Heinleinian, Clarkian, Asimovian extrapolation engines that I grew up accepting as possible. But in those days, now was like five years long, at least, and a hundred years before that, now was like like a you know a decade or twenty years long. I mean that's what it's like I think when things don't change that much. We're so used to things changing quickly that our sense of now meaning like how things are, fundamentally how things are, is really short because we know from personal experience that that can change drastically. So. Thank you so much for coming out today. Thank you. Um, I was always interested in a lot of your characters having technical augmentations. And I myself am ready for a Molly Millions upgrade anytime. But I was curious, what kind of augmentation would you have? or? Were any of your characters sort of harboring something that secretly you'd like to have? Eh. Well, if I could have anything without any side effects, you know, <laughs> or without any later drawbacks, what would I don't one I I would I would kind of like to have as a backup, I'd like to have the, the optic nerve jack in case something ever goes wrong with my eyes. Because like, like we've tweaked the rest of us so efficiently now that we, we're starting to outlive our eyes. Like human eyes aren't designed to last for, for much, you know, much longer than we're living, anyway, we're out living them. So if you just had a little jack, something really discreet that if your, if your eyes didn't work, you could plug it, plug it into a set of, set of video glasses. And, but while you got the jack, like, you know, 100 channels, <laughs> uh, 
100, you know, 100, 100 channels, web surfing, like, you know. And that's what will happen as soon as anybody gets the jack. That's the first thing they'll ask for. They'll say, cool, you know, I want to go on the net. Plug me in. And, and we'll be away. And then there'll be people outside the back door of the eye clinic going, doc, doc. I got to, you know, do that to me. And they say, your eyes are okay. He says, no, but, I, you know, I need, to be, I need to be plugged in. But <clears throat> I think the, one of the interesting things about, like, the vision, you know, writing in, 19, writing in 1984, it was fun to, to uh, it was fun to sexualize the cyborg. And it hadn't really been done in science fiction. It had cyborgs, but nobody had ever made them hot. <laughs> and, and that was part of my, you know, part of my mission was to make the cyborg hot. And, but how we're actually, go I don't know if we're actually going there. I think there'll be people who do it. I think there'll be people who do it, but they'll do it more in the spirit of people who get like like grommets through their earlobes, like it'll be like a personal personal expression. It'll be, it'll be more art than than functionality, because the way in the broadest sense, the way interface technologies seem to me to be emerging is just we're not going to need we're not going to need that. We're not going to need jacks. In it. We're not going to need jacks in our heads. We won't need chips in our heads unless it's to correct some some sort of, of meta, you know, deficiency. Because our our equipment is evolving so much more quickly than we're able to evolve. We are still, by and large the products of, of manual labor, whereas our, our, our equipment's evolving terribly quickly, and it will just be all around us. Our technology will be all around us. Our refrigerators and toasters will be smarter than our laptops are today. Everything will be connected to, to everything else, and, and we'll be there in the soup getting, getting all the information. It's like why the, the Jaron Lanier vision of, of virtual reality never happened. I mean, that was like a powerful thing for us. It was like flying cars. Look, this girl's got goggles and gloves, and she's having an experience that we can't even see, and it's making her hair fly backwards. And, and I was around for that, and it was it was... You know, it, it was quite exciting, but it never happened. It went into the museum of, of technological dreams that, that never happened because I think it turned out that you don't need any of that sort of cootie factor technology at all because if you, if you engage, if you, if you engage the person who's who's accessing your, your material in a sufficiently engrossing way, his nervous system does the helmet and the gloves for you, which is what you see when you, see, when you watch gamers. Gamers don't, need it. gamers don't need that stuff. They're doing it themselves, but that's what they're doing. Like, the world is gone. The perfect, perfect tunnel vision. And... I think, actually, I suspect the same thing is true with, with 3D, 3D cinema. As, you know, I don't think we really need that anyway because we've been, been, we've been having, people have been having way more intense and meaningful cinematic experiences than Avatar for at least 100 years, every once in a while. Not every movie, but there's, there's a whole library. There's a whole library of them, and some of them are even black and white. Good question. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Or, 
okay, I'm, I can't. You do it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't make decisions like that. I had to get up too early <laughs> to so beat the snow. In, in the world where information is pretty much ubiquitous now with Wikipedia and everything else, does it get harder as a writer to bring something truly new or something so obscure that people haven't seen it before? Does it get harder to bring that into the world because now everybody's got access to everything? Remarkably, no. You would think so. You know, I would have, I would have thought so had someone posited the, the science fiction scenario in which we now live to me in 1984. I go, oh, things are getting harder. I do, what I do feel gets harder is like, like the, the what the fuck factor gets much harder. Because at least once a month, at least once a month, I see something on the internet or even in the daily newspaper. I just go, shit. Nobody, <laughs> nobody could have made that up. And if they did, nobody would believe it. <laughs> so that's a, pro that's a problem. But finding, finding, uh, finding real, real stuff to collage into, into, into my mix, which is a big part of how I've always worked, is actually easier than ever. Because the ubiquity of information means that there are vast continents of super specialized shit that, that almost nobody's ever even heard of. It's out there if you can just find it. And there are techniques, you know, I've like sort of wacky techniques that work to find it. Or if I find, sometimes I find people who are just like, like for some reason, magnets for weird internet shit. And I just like batten on them and go, send me everything. Send, you know, send me the URL. And they do. It's a weird, we don't have a name for that, but it's actually a kind of genius. And I think one day companies will have some way of, Scanning for people who, like these people are, they're aggregators of novelty. They can, you know, or not. They aren't the aggregators, but if you are an aggregator of novelty, which is basically what magazines have always done, and it's now what many, what well, most websites do, you can find these people who have this this nameless talent for finding the most whack shit in, on the internet, and and hire them. Pay them well. Anyway, thank you very much for coming.